Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. It is Wednesday. So glad you have joined us for the Three Martini Lunch. Your stool is ready. And Jim, we have good martinis today for the first time this week. In fact, we have two of them. Good, good, and bad martinis. We are brought to you today by Freshly, Freshly offering Three Martini Lunch listeners $40 off their first two orders at Freshly.com slash martini. So, Jim, uh, let's talk about our first good martini here. And uh, Mitch McConnell on the floor of the U.S. Senate. Cocaine Mitch, once again, taking no prisoners. He has seen what we talked about on Monday with the Dumble Standard on, oh, your protest? That's awesome. Yes, that's fine, even under COVID restrictions. You, your cause? Yeah, I don't think so. And also make sure your uh, gatherings are under 10 people. In fact, you probably saw late last week, I think it was in Contra Costa County out in California, where it said uh, outdoor gatherings of up to 12 people, protests of up to 100 people are okay. Mitch McConnell's had enough of this, and here's what he said on the Senate floor about this uh, inconsistency. Politicians do not get to play red light, green light within the First Amendment. The Bill of Rights is not some a la carte menu that leaders may sample as they please. It's hard to see any rational set of rules by which mass protests should continue to be applauded, but small, careful religious services should continue to be banned. These prominent Democrats are free to let social protest outrank religion in their own consciences if they choose, but they do not get to impose their ranking on everyone else. This is precisely the point of freedom of conscience. So, Jim, pretty clear stuff there from Mitch McConnell saying you can't play red light, green light with the the Bill of Rights, and it's also not... Uh, an a la carte system here where you get to choose who gets what rights out of the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights. Uh, They belong to everyone. So not sure that's going to start happening with some of these governors and mayors, but it needed to be said. And he said it well. Yeah, there's no way to square the circle. And if you want this to change, we need our leaders to call them out as frequently and loudly as possible. Uh, I've seen people try to justify the protest to say, well, yes, but The protesters feel very strongly. They believe that this is something they need to do and they're willing to accept the risk to do that. Okay, fine. That's probably the way a lot of people feel about going to church. That's probably the way people feel about going to synagogues and mosques. There are a lot of gatherings that people go. People would say going to a funeral to mourn the dead has to be up there. People would say weddings are, are, you know, high up there as important things to do. The argument up until very recently was it doesn't matter how important this is to you. We in authority have decided whatever, you know, that it's not worth the risk. And we're not going to allow you to make that decision because you could present a risk to others after this large gathering. Well, we pointed out the uh, surprisingly low number of, uh, you know, no indications of spread at that pool at the uh, Lake of the Ozarks in Arkansas. Uh, maybe it's not that bad. And then today's morning jolt, I laid out a bunch of cases in which people have tested positive after attending a, uh, uh, protests, and in some cases, National Guardsmen, in some cases, police. Uh, you know, maybe this isn't such a good idea. But the idea that, you know, a whole bunch of lawmakers, generally Democrats, generally progressives, are going to say, well, we're going to allow this kind, but not that kind, because we like this kind of gathering, but not that kind of gathering. It is untenable. It is not consistent with the Constitution. It is not consistent with public health. It is conceivable that all of these are bad ideas and that all of these are, you know, uh, running, increasing the risk of spreading the virus. But, uh, um, the fact that some people are basically using these quarantine restrictions as a cudgel to beat the, uh, the citizens about, about the head for, you know, who, who don't share the proper views or don't share the proper belief systems, uh, utterly untenable and kudos to Mitch McConnell for calling it out. Absolutely right. I mean, uh, you look back at the uh, the founding principles beyond the First Amendment, but the First Amendment's uh, obviously what most people think about when they think of fundamental freedoms in this country. Uh, freedom uh, to exercise your religion, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom to assemble. Uh, all of those things uh, seem to be like Mitch McConnell said, a la carte, uh, your cause is okay. You can assemble. You can't yet. You can say that. You can't say that. And you can worship uh, with your congregation. You can't. So uh, that's not how this country was set up. And uh, let's hope more people come to that conclusion and, and, and voice that sentiment. But um, Jim, let's talk about, uh, like I said before, the other good 
thing that we have to talk about today besides our two martinis. And that's the product of Freshly. As I mentioned uh, the last time we talked about Freshly, I uh, got married in my 30s. And that means that I spent quite a bit of time as a single person. I don't cook well. I make a mean pot of spaghetti. Uh, I can even make some raviolis, bring those to a low boil. Uh, but uh, beyond that, there were a lot of microwave uh, dinners and other quote unquote prepared meals. You know, they kept me alive, but I wouldn't exactly go out and recommend them to a lot of people. But Freshly is different, and uh, it's not often people are willing to send you food to try, but uh, I gladly accept it. And let me tell you, Freshly is the real deal. They sent us six meals. My wife and I kind of had an NFL draft style thing with these meals. I'm like, okay, ladies first, and uh, let's just let's just pick these in order. So uh, we each picked three and uh, I decided to eat them in the order I most thought I would like them. So the most liked first and all the way down, because I figured if I didn't like the first one, I might not try the rest of them. Didn't have that problem. Liked them all. He had chicken and butternut mac. Had uh, chicken also, a different type of chicken uh, rub with, um, turned out to be a cauliflower mash, which I didn't recognize at first. Thought it was potatoes. Finished eating it anyway, even though I don't like cauliflower peppercorn steak. And then this chicken Livorno was my last draft pick, Jim. I think it might have been my favorite thing in the whole uh, in the whole batch. So really good quality stuff here. It's not frozen, as you can tell in the name, freshly. So if you think that eating better means hours of recipe research, multiple trips to the store, and hours of monotonous meal prep, not true, because now you have Freshly. At Freshly, they understand that food needs to be delicious, healthy, and simple. Because let's be honest, if it's not easy, a lot of people aren't going to do it. And if it doesn't taste good, a lot of people aren't going to want to eat it. With Freshly, you can avoid the grocery store and enjoy freshly prepared dinners delivered fresh, not frozen, right to your door. Put your feet up and relax. Freshly's chefs and nutritionists do all the hard work. All you do is heat it for three minutes and dinner is done. Imagine better for you golden oven fried chicken creamy springtime risotto, and fall-apart tender beef brisket. Those are just a few of the more than 30 health-conscious options to choose from. So join nearly one and a half million satisfied customers and skip the shopping, prepping, cooking, and cleanup. Freshly is offering Three Martini Lunch listeners $40 off your first two orders at freshly.com slash martini. That's freshly.com slash martini. All right, Jim, on to our second good martini. And this isn't going to start the way you would think a good martini would start, but uh, Cops is canceled. So far, it's just the TV show, but uh, there's a lot of folks around the country that want to actually cancel cops. Uh, We see it in Minneapolis, uh, where the city council folks there want to dismantle the police. And you got the media saying, we don't really mean defund and dismantle. Yeah, no, we do. And then out in Seattle, uh, their uber progressive mayor is, is uh, under fire for not wanting to completely disband the police. And so you're wondering uh, just how much momentum is this going to have? And so you think, who would these people listen to? Bernie Sanders. These seem like Bernie type people, right? Well, Bernie, amazingly enough, Jim, doesn't think we should get rid of the police. So he says, do I think we should not have police departments in America? No, I don't. There's no city in the world that does not have police departments. Not sure that's true. What you need are, I didn't call for more money for police departments. I call for police departments that have well-educated, well-trained, well-paid professionals. And too often around this country right now, you have police officers who take the job at very low payment, don't have much education, don't have much training. And I want to change that. He also wants to transform police departments uh, that can deal with things like mental illness, addiction, and other things. Jim, this might be the most rational thing Bernie Sanders has said. Uh, I'm sure there are points in here we could quibble with, but the fact that his movement uh, has now gotten out past his ability to rein it in is kind of interesting to watch. But uh, even Bernie, the leader of the quote unquote revolution here, realizes that uh, some of his followers have gone, as you would say, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And this is kind of intriguing because, look, it's not like Bernie Sanders is running for office again. It's not like he's going to be running for president again. It's not like he's got some sort of, you know, centrist appeal that he needs to balance out or anything. This is. There's no reason to think that he's moderating a viewpoint. This is genuinely what he thinks. Um, And it's intriguing because you've seen, you know, some folks insisting, you know, oh, don't be silly conservatives. When people say defund the police or abolish the police, they don't mean defunding the police or abolishing the police. Uh, And there are some protesters who explicitly say, yes, no, that's exactly what we mean. There are others who don't. Uh, I've seen a lot of folks pointing to the example of Camden, New Jersey, and, you know, based on, there was a very good piece in this in National Review yesterday, 
look, if by defunding the police, these uh, protesters mean they want to end the police union, if they say they want to reduce or eliminate the fringe pay to police officers, if they really mean they want to increase the size of the police force, then they want to embrace community engagement. Greg, I don't want to, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but uh, I think maybe we have a deal. That doesn't really sound like defunding or abolishing, though. <laughs> No, it means reforming, which is, I think, what most people think needs to happen here. Uh, amazing. But uh, we got some breaking news here. The Minneapolis Police Department is withdrawing from police union contract negotiations. And the first step of what the chief there says would be reforms to the agency in the wake of the death of George Floyd. So we'll see what that ends up looking like. Uh, we certainly saw some strong comments from uh, the police union in New York City yesterday, a couple of their officials. Um, and Jim, you mentioned the fact that Bernie Sanders is no longer running for president, which is obviously true. And given his age of nearly 80 years old, you have to think this was the last go around for him. And yesterday was primary day in a number of places. And according to the reports I've seen, Joe Biden has now clinched enough delegates to be officially declared the presumptive nominee, which could be an interesting time or a sad time for our old friend Irving Schmidlap. Uh, so, <laughs> some, some of you see his posts online, uh, but now that he's officially eliminated, I look forward to his post today to determine whether or not he's staying in the race, maybe a convention floor fight, waits to see if Biden somehow stumbles. Does he go third party? Does he finally rally behind the nominee? I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen here. So I want to point out, for those who think, I don't run the Irving Schmidlap Twitter account. <laughs> so after insisting Irving Schmidlap does not exist, he seemed to be somehow willed into existence <laughs> by the listenership. Um, it's, it's sort of like, it's kind of fascinating. Remember in uh, Charlie Brown Christmas where the kids just wave their hands and they turn the sickly tree into this gorgeous new tree with no discernible, you know, they apparently have the ability to reshape matter and reality to their wishes. Yes. Listeners, I guess we have that ability. It's kind of amazing. Um, so yeah, my suspicion is Schmidlap will want a, a recount. I've checked a few places for write-ins. And I have not seen any Irving Schmidlap write-ins yet, but I have not completed it. There is still a chance for this. And, you know, like, here's the thing. Um, I suppose you could say it looks like it's not going to happen for Irving Schmidlap or Bernie Sanders or anybody else. But um, Biden feeling healthy these days? As far as I know, I think Terry McAuliffe uh, gave a lot of people tons of confidence earlier this week when he said, oh, he's fine. He's in his basement. There's a couple people that see him. Uh, so there's no rush. That's what yeah, you want. You know, That's <laughs> I suppose you could keep him isolated for the remainder of the presidential campaign. <laughs> Not that much of a campaign, but okay. Good luck. You know. So who knows? History hey. takes strange turns, even for the likes of Irving Schmidlap. Hey, William McKinley had the front porch campaign. Joe Biden apparently has the uh, basement campaign. The basement we'll campaign. We'll see if it works. <laughs> All right, let's move on to our bad martini. Uh, we know that there were a bunch of protests, right? And, uh, and many businesses were destroyed, uh, things set on fire, lots of property damage, looting. Uh, but now there's even more. So according to a recording obtained by the Daily Beast, Dr. Burks has reported that there have been 70 coronavirus testing sites that have been destroyed amid the protest. I would assume most of them in the cities. And so right as we're talking about people possibly getting tested because they've been around so many people in these protests, there's now fewer places to do that, Jim. And so I haven't seen a lot of media hand-wringing about that. I've seen hand-wringing about Trump perhaps uh, relaunching his rallies later this month. But uh, what do you make of the fact that even COVID testing sites were apparently fair game for these people? One of the points that's worth making is that, you know, maybe I, you know, you cannot support arson. You cannot report. You cannot support looting. You cannot support violence in the name of any cause. You know, no matter how noble, because once you start doing that, it stops being a noble cause. But one other reason that everybody is not supposed to play with fire, literally or metaphorically, and is not supposed to whip up anger and rage in the general public is that once they start on that rampage, once they start destroying things. They don't start drawing distinctions. They don't start picking, you know, this is when you saw that progressive newspaper editor down in uh, Raleigh saying, you know, we were a progressive newspaper. How could they ransack our offices? It's because they didn't care. They, they don't care. And so the idea, you know, I'm sure there's somebody who would say, wait, this is a lab that is processing coronavirus tests. How could you possibly want to destroy that? But the people doing the destroying, they're not thinking. They're not uh, critically evaluating what's in their way. They're just burning and destroying whatever they encounter until someone comes and stops them or until someone, you know, comes along and it's either, you know, deters them or intimidates them or makes them recognize, oh, I better not keep doing this. I'm going to get in real trouble. 
And that is, you know, a, a, a hard truth. I think a lot of people want to dance around at a time like this. So the idea of, you know, oh, the, the, pro- the violence was justified or it was necessary or was understandable. Sorry, none of that applies to burning down a coronavirus uh, thing. But yeah, as we, as we have, we've reopened society, apparently, and uh, we decided the protests were hunky-dory. And today's morning jolt, I laid out the cops and guardsmen and uh, protesters. And we go, I guess the pandemic, like the general attitude amongst the whole lot of people is that the pandemic is over. I guess my closing question, Greg, would be, did anybody tell the virus that? <laughs> well, everybody's been talking about a, a second wave. Most people assumed it would come, you know, when temperatures got colder. So late fall, early winter, something like that. But uh, there's some evidence that it's happening in, in some states already. So we'll see if yeah, we I get mean, an early second spike or, or not. At, at this point, I'm not sure the first wave is over. <laughs> No, well, that could that could be true also. You're, you're going to have like the, the you know waves of the virus hitting at different times. Arizona's not looking good right now. South Carolina, Imperial County, and California, you know, these are places that didn't get hit that bad in March and April in the early stages. Certainly on a level like say New York City or Northern New Jersey or something. So when people are like, oh, is this a second wave? Well, wait a minute, no, <laughs> no, this, this is still the first one. Wait, waves can take a while. We will see how things shake out. But, uh, you know, there are some parts of the country where, yeah, you're probably doing fine. But there are other parts of the country where actually, no, those cases are starting to pile up. It's generally in the South and in the West. Uh, and also, I'd note generally in communities that have fewer hospital beds than, say, you know, a big city like New York City. So uh, good luck, America. We're reopened for business. And I hope we all stay healthy. We're back to fighting about coronavirus. I mean, I'm trying to. No, no one wants to talk about coronavirus anymore. <laughs> Apparently not. Jim, we'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Don't forget about our good friends over at Freshly. Right now, you can get $40 off your first two orders at freshly.com slash martini, freshly.com slash martini. Please subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch. Leave us a kind review with five stars. Get us on those home devices. Just say play Three Martini Lunch podcast. And we will see you on the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch.